So music, neuroscience, and education. When we first look at these three words, it's not immediately clear how they relate to each other. In fact, if you had a chance to take a look at my profile on the event website, you may have seen something about funky guitar music and brain science, and you may be thinking, what kind of planet is this guy from? <laughs> now, the truth is, I sometimes ask myself the same question, but I always come back to the same answer. While I enjoy being deep into each of these disciplines, what really gets me going is connecting the dots. It's when we're living in these spaces in between that I think we learn the most. When we're not just focused on the end result that we're trying to get to, but when we're enjoying and focused on the journey that takes us to that end result. So today, I'd like to share with you my own personal journey through music, neuroscience, and education, and what I've learned from the spaces in between. Now before we start, let's talk a little bit about what we mean by when we say the spaces in between. Most of the time when people talk about the spaces in between, this is not a place you want to be. And you know this if you've ever tried to get in the back of a car with two other people. You definitely do not want to be stuck in the middle. When people say the phrase, between the rock and a hard place, that's certainly not a place we want to be either. People talk about being a middle child, like it's some kind of disease. Although these middle child can sometimes learn more than their siblings because they have the opportunity to be both the student and the teacher. Even in some religions, the in-between space is not where you want to find yourself. And finally, even in the scientific world of chemistry, the transition state is the part of the reaction with the least stability. So let me back up a little bit here because it sounds like I'm giving the spaces in between a bad name. And I better fix that before the organizers throw me out of this conference hall. So let's take a good example. I had the great opportunity to work at the University of South Florida in the laboratory of Manny Duncan. In that laboratory, we were collaborating with the mechanical engineering department, and we were developing a system that people with locked-in syndrome, meaning that they can't move and they can't interact with the environment and they can't speak, but their mental faculties are still perfect. We we're developing a system to help them interact with the environment better. So let's take a look at what can happen in the spaces in between neuroscience and mechanical engineering. So you can see here, in the middle of the screen, you have a robotic arm. The robotic arm is positioned to grip this coffee cup, something that I'm sure is very dear to our hearts. So it's going to slowly grip the coffee cup. And this robotic arm is connected to a computer, which is then connected to an electrode cap that the user is wearing. In this case, the user is me. The, electric, the electrode cap is collecting electrical activity from the surface of the scalp and then converting that electrical activity through a kind of analysis that I'm not going to get into now, but if there are some engineers out there, I'm, I'll be glad to nerd it out with you at the end of the session. Um, but let's say for now that it, con it converts these electrical signals to a command that the computer can use to move the robotic arm. Now, as you can see here, it's very slow. And you might be thinking right about now that by the time the coffee reaches me, it's going to be cold. And that's probably true, but there's two things we have to keep in mind. Number one, this is meant for patients who can't interact with the environment in any other way. So even at this pace, they'll benefit greatly from this. And number two, this really represents the first step in the process. And so this is just one quick example of the magic that can happen in the spaces in between. And in this case, we're talking about the spaces in between mechanical engineering and neuroscience. Now, around the same time that I was working on this, I was also involved in a little bit of music. After all, you have to keep your sanity somehow. And in particular, I had the opportunity to play with some of the best funk and jazz musicians that I've ever met, and I learned a lot from them. Learning from them made me ask the question, how does music change our brain? Might be a nerdy question for a musician to ask, but that's me. 
It turns out that a whole community of neuroscientists are also interested in that same question. And that's why I eventually matriculated in a PhD program in Boston at the Harvard-MIT Division of Health Science and Technology, where I found a group of scholars that were interested in the same questions. Now, I'm going to quickly take this opportunity now to thank my mentors and my lab. On the left, you can see all of my mentors from Harvard and MIT, and on the right, you can see my laboratory. I just want to quickly thank everybody, because without these people, this presentation you're listening to would not have been possible. Now, at our lab, we're interested in neuroscience, and here we see two brain cells communicating with each other. This gap that you see here, we call a synapse, and I just thought it might be, a man, might be worth mentioning that the synapse is defined literally as the space in between two brain cells. Anyway, we're interested in the lab in a very particular space in between. We're interested in the space between speaking and singing. Now, you may have heard that music uses the right side of your brain relatively more than other activities do. And here we see two brain scans. This is the top of the brain. This is the bottom of the brain. And we're sort of looking at a slice from, from the top view. And these yellow and red blobs that you see indicate areas in the brain that are becoming active relative to the task that the subject is performing. So we can see here that when a subject is in the fMRI scanner doing a speaking task, for example, saying the sentence, happy birthday to you, we see activity mostly on the right side of the brain. This is a subtraction image, so there's actually other activity, but this was when you compare it to a silence condition. We can see activation on the, right, the left side of the brain. When the subject, same subject, is in the scanner and doing a singing task, for example, singing the words, happy birthday to you, then we see a lot more activation on the right side of the brain. Now, sure, this is cool, and it makes pretty pictures that we can look at, but who does this benefit, and why is this important? Well, it turns out that patients, when they get a, certain, uh, a stroke in a certain part of their brain, they lose these left hemisphere structures that usually would be used for speaking. So then you, you might ask the idea, since we know that singing and music use the right hemisphere, is there a way that we can integrate singing into the therapy to try to help them regain some function in their language and speech by sort of bypassing this damaged area and instead using a different route? And in order to answer that question, like usually, scientists would want to ask another question. And that question is, what's so special about the singing brain? And so, for example, what's so special about the brain of professional singers? So what we're looking at here is a graphic that's generated out of data from 11 professional singers in the Boston area. So this is not just an illustration. This orange structure that you see here it's called the arcuate fasciculus, but we're not going to worry about that today. This orange structure, basically you can think of it as a bundle of wires that connects the hearing parts of the brain to the speech parts of the brain. And as you can imagine, this bundle of wires is very important in speech and in singing. So we asked the question, is there something special about this structure in singers? Not just relative to people who have never had musical training, but even relative to people who have had musical training, but not in the voice. And it actually turns out that this structure in singers has a significantly higher volume, not just relative to non-musicians, but even relative to matched professional musicians who don't sing. So the moral of the story is that there really is something special about singing and the brain. So how can we integrate this into a therapy? Well, I'm going to show some videos here of a therapy that's being developed in our lab under the direction of the lab director. His name is Dr. Gottfried Schlaug, and he is a stroke neurologist at the Harvard Medical School Teaching Hospitals. And what we're going to see first is a video of a patient, a young lady, who had a stroke in the left side of her brain and basically is left with very little function on the left side. So if she's regaining functionality, 
then it must be because her right hemisphere is learning to take over the functions of the, right, of the left hemisphere. So the first video we'll look at is the sort of before therapy video. And if you're watching this on the internet, I apologize that we can't show this part because we have an obligation to protect the privacy of our patients. But for all of us here today, we can witness this in action. So right away you can see that there is a benefit that's introduced when we integrate singing into the therapy program. So this is yet another example of the magic that can happen in the spaces in between. And in this case, we're talking about the spaces in between singing and speaking. Now just like my journey from music took me to neuroscience, my work with neuroscience and learning how the brain can change in response to different types of therapies is making me want to cross the bridge from neuroscience into education. Because after all, education is another type of training that might change the brain. And so looking at this figure here, the main question of education, you can sum it up as being, what is the best way of educating an individual? What is the best way of educating a community? And usually, we take a top-down approach to this. And to me, this represents the tip of the iceberg. But it's effective. For example, we want to make sure that our infrastructure and our policies are those that we think are working in the world's leading institutions. We want to get the right curriculum, the testing procedures, and the programs, and we want to get the best faculty that we can get that seem to be doing the right job. We want to retain those faculty, and then we want to encourage the following generations to follow. But like I said before, this to me represents the tip of the iceberg, because if the goal of education ultimately is educating the brain, then why don't we have neuroscience in this conversation? You can imagine that if we did, we would have a more complete picture. We would have a bottom-up strategy that complements what we're already doing. So you can imagine, for example, that the policy adoption and the testing, getting the right facilities and the curriculum, and getting the best faculty are the sort of, are, are what relate to the fruits of a good education system. But we can't start with the fruits. We have to start with the roots. And in this case, the roots is understanding how the brain changes in response to different kinds of education methods. Now I know this is a little bit abstract, so let me quickly give you an example. And this is something that as far as me or my mentors know has not been done. A lot of people, students from the Middle East, bless you, a lot of students from the Middle East choose to travel abroad to get their education. Many other students choose to stay in the Middle East and get their education. As a nerdy scientist, this represents an opportunity to do some groundbreaking research. Because what you have is two groups from the same population that are basically the same. They have basically the same genetics, basically the same brains. The only difference is one of those groups went and was exposed to a different education program. So, for example, we could follow their brain development, both groups, and we could get an idea of what works and what doesn't work in both education systems and that, of course, would inform us, and we could sort of combine the strengths of both, and that would lead to an education system that takes a more bigger picture approach and not only uses the top-down strategy. And ultimately, I think this is what will give us the bigger picture and not just the tip of the iceberg. So I want to end here by asking a question. What occupies the space in between everything? It's a little bit of a big question, but I would propose that one answer is that education occupies the spaces in between everything. The more we can educate ourselves and educate each other, the better we can enrich ourselves and enrich the environment. The more that we can focus on the journey that takes us there and not just the final result, the more that we can get a more bigger picture and holistic view of what's going on around us. And I think it's in forums like TED 
where we all can gather and we can learn from each other, from different disciplines that we might not know that much about. Personally, I've learned a lot today that I've never knew about. So I want to just take this opportunity to quickly thank all of the speakers that spoke today. I learned a lot that I didn't know before. And I also want to thank all of the organizers for putting on this first TEDx Abu Dhabi conference. And I want to thank them for teaching us all a little bit more about the spaces in between. Thanks.